Today we're going to have a look at North Korea and the Korean War. So earlier I sent out um, schedule and PPTs just to keep you updated. Uh, those PPTs are primarily for your reference for the exam to try to keep everybody on an even keel. That doesn't mean you can just sit and sleep during class and go, I've got the PPTs now, that's all right. Because it's hard to understand them, I think, if you're not engaging uh, with them. So you should be up to date with all the PPT information. Um, I, yep, and schedule I sent out. That's kind of a tentative schedule, but where we are at the moment. And from that, you should understand there's a presentation coming up a week on Monday in which you have sort of around between five and seven minutes to tell us something that has interested you to find your own path on what we've studied thus far, right? Could be something that we've sort of overlooked or, but looking around our material and giving your own perspective, telling your classmates what you think. Um, I will talk more about that presentation a little bit next week. I'll give you a little bit more information just so you know exactly what to do. But at the moment, you should be thinking about a topic. And the challenge will be, well, how can I do something awesome in seven minutes, right? David gets three hours and he doesn't do anything awesome. How can I do it in seven minutes? That's the challenge for you, okay? It's not easy, but I think it should be interesting to give everybody the chance to speak and express their thoughts and their ideas. Um, in terms of the self-development assignment, I should have put it in the email, but I didn't. I apologize. Uh, for those of you that are doing it, please don't see that email as a sign that you need to start reading really quickly. That's not the point. You should read slowly. You should read critically. You should read trying to understand what it is. That's the goal. So don't think, oh my God, I've got to see David. I've got to finish the book and that's it. That's not the point. The point is to read it slowly. The point is to try to comprehend it. The point is to take paragraph by paragraph and find out what these people are saying. I think that's more a worthwhile uh, practice than just finishing a book, right? So if you are doing that, don't think you have to speed up. It might be more advisable to slow down. Are there any questions or comments about schedules, presentations before we start off? Uh, Taylor? How many? Eight. Eight. Yes. <laughs> Hands up if you're not here on Monday, please. Okay. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> can I go to Jeju as well? I mean, Jeju is awesome. I want to. I want to go to Jeju. This is not fair. Um, for those of you that will be here on Monday, for those of you that will be here on Monday, how many of you have seen Taxi Unjon Sa, a taxi driver? I think I know what we might be doing on Monday then. <laughs> really famous film, Bong Joon Ho, great. It's about Gwangju, it's about democracy, it's a marvelous film. So if I can work out, we might watch that on Monday. That doesn't mean we're not going to do anything. I think you'll probably learn as much from this movie as anything else. So we'll do a discussion uh, and we'll critically analyze the movie. Okay, thank you for letting me know about that. Um, for those of you going to Jeju Island, try to go to Kao Udo. Udo is a really good place. You can get rainbow hamburgers and things like that there. It's really cool. If there are no other questions, let's start today. So the, that was awesome. Let's start with a question for you all. The question is this, what is North Korea to you? Obviously, North Korea is uh, different things to many different people. Um, Tim, what's North Korea? Mm -hmm. Very good, so it's the northern part, yep. Do you know who these two people are, Tim? Yeah. 
yeah, very good. They are the leaders of North Korea. So this is Kim Jong-un's uh, father and this is Kim Jong-un's grandfather, Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung. Okay. Um, Lana, same question. What is North Korea? Yep. I could say what is North Korea to the rest of the world is a country that does not let anybody inside. I guess trying to keep that bloodline, like she was saying. Um, and then, yeah, I, I want to say it's like a threat or it's viewed as a threat to the rest of the world, but like, I guess the South Korea or some South Koreans there is a possibility that like North Korea could one day be united and mm -hmm. are willing to do so. So I'm just going to want to finish an answer, sorry. No, but I think you touch on some important points that to some people it's a threat uh, and to other people it's not. Um, to, some South, to some South Koreans it might be romanticized and to some other South Koreans it might be a, a dangerous place. Um, it doesn't let people in. It lets some people in. Americans are not allowed to go. I, I'm allowed to go. I've had opportunities to go and teach in North Korea, um, but I've kind of said no <laughs> because I drink a lot and I have opinions and I don't really want to have to watch what I say. I like freedom. I like open societies and uh, I don't trust my alcoholism. So uh, I haven't really gone there for those reasons, but you can go. I've had students from China um, visiting <coughs> South Korea as exchange students at Seoul Women's University and they're disappointed to have come to Seoul Women's University because their friends went to Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. So their point is, well, we can come to South Korea anytime. My friend went to Kim Il-sung University this semester. I'm really jealous of her because it's an opportunity that not everybody gets. And my South Korean students in the class heard that and went, what? <laughs> you would rather go to Pyongyang than to Seoul? Students like, yeah, that's an interesting thing. So it's open to some people. Yeah. Audrey, any final ideas on what North Korea might be? Um, I'm not sure if Enigma is the right word, but I feel like there's um, a large sense of mystery, which is kind of how I've grown up in the US, where there's mm. like an idea that we don't know what's happening in North Korea. Um, I've just seen some things online. There were, I saw a video of someone who they got to cross the green beam, like exposing North Korea or some mm -hmm. Warm beer. Yeah, and he, mm -hmm. I think, like, stole a stop sign and, like, in, um, like went to prison or went to, like, a camp and died. And I think that reinforced, um, like, an America, American idea that it's a very dangerous land and mysterious place because there was very little information to reveal to the world. Mm. And that nature of it being an enigma does two things. It, one, it drives media attention. So for the longest time, the most famous Korean in the world was Kim Jong-il or Kim Il-sung. People knew about the North Korean leader or bad man more than they did about South Korean presidents. Yeah? So if you went around the world and asked the 8 billion people who's the most famous Korean, now we have sort of BTS and Bong Joon-ho sort of changing that a little bit. But for the longest time, if you took an average of those 8 billion people, not just sort of a, an American-centric, uh, these figures would have been probably the highest. And that was a big problem for South Korea. So this enigma that Audrey mentions drives media, drives clicks, it drives attention. North Korea likes being in the media. It likes being part of the narrative because then that solidifies its existence as a state. It also, however, encourages Orientalism, like Edward Said's 1978 book. Um, is your hand up, Donla? Yeah, yeah. yeah, sorry. It, do the, like, next, like, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure. Oh, I think, like, this is all about North Korea, is that we can, like, in America, my education is, like, a failed state in the sense that South Korea is, like, the U.S. is fought us, and we should, like, we should look at you as, like, mm. communist, Russia, a target of a lot of, like, their propaganda, a, a huge part of McCarthyism, mm. the thing that, you know, really backing up, um, 
propaganda against communism in general, so that this is a terrible state, look at all these human rights violations, mm. what else, whatever else is going on in North Korea. Mm. Um, and the, also, like you said, you mentioned Orientalism, really backing up this idea. If, I think that North Korea, when you're looking at today's um, Northeast Asia, really the only explicit country or nation that is still used as um, typical yellow peril propaganda in the U.S. at least, because mm -hmm. everywhere else is, has been open, like Japan, mm -hmm. Korea, China has been open to restrict trade relations and whatnot, but mm -hmm. North Korea is that one state, nation that has yet to be open, has yet to have any, um, not any, but yet to have um, U.S. military. Doesn't have a Starbucks, we might say, <laughs> Yeah, is one way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Is it a failed state, Donla? Is North Korea a failed state? In my opinion, I, I don't think I have um, enough background knowledge to know about um, whether or not we're called a failed state or not, but I am definitely a proponent of communism, so not in that sense, no. It, okay, I don't think it's a failed state because, personally, I don't think it is, because it has survived. With the whole world arguably against it since 1948, North Korea has survived. It has outlived the Soviet Union. Yeah? It has lasted. So is it a failed state? I don't think so. It's a successful state. It has a seat at the United Nations. <clears throat> it's on various international boards. Now, so we might have normative judgments against it. We might think it's good or bad and such forth, but objectively, uh, it's hard to describe it as a failed state because it's lasted uh, this long. Now, in terms of what is North Korea, when we've done Tangwon and we've done Joseon, we've done Japanese colonialism, I've given you a bit about Park Chung-hee, I've never given you one simple narrative. I, I've never really told you that this is what happened. I've, I've tried to give you different views and vistas um, because there are different possibilities. And views that makes it harder to convey information actually if there was just one story to tell you it would be easier but we have the same thing with North Korea so what is North Korea to some people it's a theocracy so this would be the work of Ra Jong Il Ra Jong Il was the South Korean British ambassador uh, he was South Korean but he served as the ambassador in the United Kingdom for some time uh, he's a member of this university, he used to lecture, he's a very old gentleman now, but he wrote a book about Jang Song Tech, and Ra Jong Il's uh, view is that North Korea is a theocracy. Theocracy, theology, religion, is one that rules through the power of God. So Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il, Kim Jong Un, they are like God-like figures, deities. So. Uh, Ambassador Ra Jong-il writes about North Korea as if it is a theocracy. So it's not a communist state, right? It's not a democratic people's republic to Ra Jong-il, but it's a theocracy where these figures, this family, have entered into a cult of personality. And so Kim Jong-il was born on the top of Bekdu Mountain when a star came out. He was born in Russia. Kim Jong-il was born on top of Bektu Mountain when a star came over and you can go and see the little hut. It's very kind of Jesus and the manger like story. North Korea count their years in Juche since the day of Kim Il-sung's birth in 1912. So for North Koreans, it's not 2021. It's like 149 Juche. Because they don't care about Jesus Christ. They care about Kim Il-sung, right? Kim Il-sung was born the day the Titanic sank. A little bit of pub, in, I don't know, pub bar information for you. <laughs> to some people, North Korea is a theocracy. It's a state run with a God family. To some people, um, Sheena Greetens, um, an American scholar, she writes about it as a kleptocracy, a, like a mafia state a state in which the ruling class 
take, steal, like kleptomania is stealing, like steal from the people. So if you take the very hardline approach, this kind of neocon American approach, you would call it a kleptocracy, and that comes up a lot in uh, their intelligence reports, I see this word. For some people, it's a monarchy. Now, for some people, when you think of the, the you know, the, the royal families in the Netherlands, the royal family in Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, the royal family, we watch The Crown on Netflix, and we're like, yay, British royal family, that looks nice. <laughs> to some people, North Korea is just like that. It's just like a monarchy. What's the difference between Queen Elizabeth II and Kim Jong-un? Queen Elizabeth is kind of more like a figurehead in the idea that like, you have parliament that's actually doing things. It's more of um, an oligarchy. You know, the state's an oligarchy. But it's like you have multiple people that are ruling as opposed to Kim Jong-un, who's just like, he's the one who's really making all of the decisions. This is not quite true, very good, Alexandra, but it's not like Kim Jong-un makes all every decision. There are factions with inside North Korea. The army have different interests to the Workers' Party. And the people inside the army and the people inside the Workers' Party all have their own interests and desires and dreams and fears. Right? That's one of those things where we sort of step over Orientalism. Yes, Kim Jong-un is the leader. Yes, his word is very strong. But there are factions in North Korea that push and pull and create tension in the decision making. For example, Kim Jong-un, and we'll come to this, knows that he has to keep the Yangban, the aristocracy, the elites of Pyongyang happy. Right? If the people living in Pyongyang start running out of money and food and designer clothes, they're going to be angry. They're going to say, well, let's go live in South Korea instead. So there are various competing factions in North Korea, each with their own interest. And you'll probably see, for example, the military, the Workers' Party, which is their sort of, um, what would you call it? Their parliament. I'm sorry, I struggle for American words sometimes. Their parliament, their national assembly. Yeah, They have politicians. They have votes. Right. So the military, the Workers' Party, and the elite in Pyongyang. They will all have their own interests and those interests might conflict with each other. So while Kim Jong-un does make decisions, yeah. it's called a monarchy because of course the rule passes from one to the next, right? That's, that's what we do in the United Kingdom. Um, some people might call it a democratic people's republic. That's what North Korea calls itself, the democratic people's republic of Korea. D-P-R-K. That's obviously the English name. It's also a translation of the Korean. So for them, it's the People's Republic. Yes, Kim Jong-un is the head, but for them, they have votes. They have elections. Yeah, the candidate gets 99% of the votes, right? That's true. It happens. But for them, they call it a democratic People's Republic. For other people, it's a communist state. We heard Donna say, right, I'm a communist. Great. For some people, it is a communist state in which, <clears throat> well, this actually makes us try to have to then define communism, social in socialism, Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, Kim Il Sungism, Jucheism. Very, diff very different, um, which I won't go into that right now because of semantics. But in terms of that, I'll just teach you this one word which is Juche, that's the official policy religion of North Korea. Everybody has a different, so it's J-U-C-H-E, English, Juche. Montre, do you know what Juche means? Um, no, but didn't you like say earlier that like something similar sounding to that was like in a earlier sense? Yes, Juchenyan. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's exactly the same word. It's the same word. Juche, does anybody know what Juche means? Okay. Self-reliance. Self-reliance. To be a subject. Traditionally, it means the word subject. So if you want to get into this idea of historical subjectivity, right, which is another sort of Marxist way of looking at the world, if you want to get into historical subjectivity, subject, self-reliance. We can do it by ourselves. 
Of course, that's not quite true because North Korea has always had support from China and the Russia, and it sort of plays them off between them. It's like if your parents are divorced and you tell your mum, Dad's going to buy me a motorbike for Christmas. Oh, and he's going to, you know, you get good gifts from both of them. North Korea has always done that. But juche is the idea of self-reliance. To some people, it's the last home of the Chosun people. To some, it, it, it's, you know, that's where the Korean story continues. Here is the American puppet state with leaders that go and meet their American superiors. So China has been replaced by America, the outside forces. Here we get into sort of a bit of ethno-nationalism and things like that, of course. But to some people, North Korea is the last home of the Chosun people. It's where the West didn't get in. The West got into China with the Opium Wars. The West got into Japan with Commodore Perry. The West got into Korea, then Japan came in, or the West gave Korea to Japan in that Taft-Katsura agreement right, of 1895. So North Korea is the last home of that story from Pangun to now. North Korea is the home of it. And to some other people, it is a brave resistance fighter against American imperialism. You know, it is the one that stands up and says, OK, you say we can't have nuclear bombs, we're going to do it anyway. And if you come near us, we'll get you back because America, you put nuclear bombs on Japan twice. So we're scared of you. We didn't do it yet. You did. Right. So to some people, it's a you know, anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist resistance. These are all legitimate views that you will hear and read and see. Which one of these views you take is kind of entirely up to you. Nevertheless, you should be aware of them. A whole multitude of views exist like this in terms of South Korea as well. President Moon Jae-in, here on the left, uh, with Chairman Kim Jong-un in Pyongyang. President Moon Jae-in is the third South Korean president to meet the North Korean president. Kim Dae-jung uh, met, he went to Pyongyang once in the year 2000, the summer of 2000. That was the first meeting, 21 years ago. He won a Nobel Peace Prize for that. He met him once, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father. No Mu Hyun, the next liberal president, went in 2007, met Kim Jong-il once. President Moon Jae-in has met Kim Jong-un three times thus far that we know of. So this is quite a big change. Uh, met him in North Korea, met him in Panmunjom, and met him with President Double, uh, ex -president, you know, with Trump at that three-way meeting. So uh, that's quite a big step up in relations. Yeah? There have always been talks and promises of a North Korean chairman to come to South Korea. It's never happened. There's always this talk. There's always this hope. Will Kim Jong-il come to South Korea? No. Will Kim Jong-un come to South Korea? Hasn't happened. His sister, Kim Yo-jong, uh, came down for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. So he sent his sister a couple of times and, and other high-ranking officials. But the South Koreans have always gone to North Korea. Now, this is kind of symbolic. You want to come to us? You want to come and pay tribute? We'll let you today. And so it puts the power in the hands of the North Koreans. Think about what Korea had to do vis-a-vis -vis China. It always had to go and pay tribute, right? Had to go to Beijing, had to send uh, people there to pay tribute because China had the emperor. And so, you know, you have to visit the important people. The important people don't come to your house. You want to see your professor or something like that? You have to go and see them. You want to go and see someone important? You have to go and see them. So this creates a power dynamic. This definitely creates a power dynamic on who is more important. North Korea says, well, you know, you want to come to us? Bill Clinton's been to Pyongyang. 
when some people were arrested, he went on a special trip there. Jimmy Carter's been to Pyongyang. Madeleine Albright's been to Pyongyang. I believe Hillary Clinton's been to Pyongyang. People always go there. And it's one of these things that, you know, for North Korea, it's a sign of their power that people come to see them. Recently in South Korea, so this is the unified, this is the peninsula map. Okay, so this has been going uh, for about 20 odd years, this peninsula map here. And obviously, this is a big symbol for South Korean people because it's not a divided land. It has Dokdo, Dokdo here, which is the island disputed with Japan, uh, which is Korean. But Japan disputes it. Um, so that's really important. Jeju down here, where our students are going. But this is a very emotional powerful symbol for Korean people. This is Kaesong, right? So in between sort of north and south, they had this place where South Korea would build these buildings and North Korean workers would come and work there and they would produce stuff. It was like working together. That was the idea. Let's work together and we'll produce materials and textiles using South Korean industry, technology and infrastructure and North Korean cheap labor. Doesn't sound nice when you say it like that, actually. But that's what they were doing. A few months ago, North Korea blew the building up. They did, they blew it up live. They said, we're gonna blow that building up. South Korean property, by the way, who built it. North Korea said, we're not happy with you, South Korea. So we're gonna blow that building up. And everyone went, okay. And they did. The National Security Act. So this is the Kaesong Liaison Building, if you want to read more about it, by the way. You can see GIFs and videos. Kaesong, generally spelled K-A-E-S-O-N-G. Liaison Building, there's an industrial complex there. So it's very interesting con to consider that after meeting Chairman Kim three times, North Korea still does this. The National Security Act, since 1948. It is illegal to praise North Korea in South Korea. I'm a little bit hesitant that this class is being recorded. Genuinely, genuinely. Not that I'm gonna suddenly start out and go long live, <laughs> it's not the point, but it's still, it's still technically illegal. And who knows if some super neocon conservative government comes in in South Korea, five years in the future, goes back through materials and say, right, you, you could happen could happen it happened 20 years ago right in south korea to even sort of say the names of the north korean leaders it's only recently opened up in south korea that we can start talking about this a little bit openly definitely helped by the current government and previous left governments but technically illegal to say or praise north korea in south korea Taylor? I have just a question about the, um, the building that got blown up too. Like, so, because it was like, in, was it in between? Yep. Two? Okay, so nobody, South Korea really can't be like, well, why'd you do that? I'm going to sue you because North Korea's like, it's all my land. And South Korea's like, it's all my land, so. They're going to sue North Korea? Well, you can't well, sue it. I know, yeah. Hmm. Well, you can't sue, I mean, you can't sue anybody, but like, like you, they can't really say anything because North Korea's like, well, it was on my land, but. In 19, let me try to give you some background. Um, I might get a little bit of this information, you check it on Google. But in 1987, in 1987, as the Olympics was coming to Seoul in 1988, right? So one year before the Olympics, it was already announced they were preparing for it. North Korea bombed a passenger flight, a Korean air flight killed about 250 people, put a bomb on it, blew it up. So they were like, hey, you guys, we don't like you. So they blew up a passenger flight, 250 people. And South Korea, the Olympics is coming. What can we do? 2010, I want to say 2010, we might have to check this, the Chonan. Chonan is a boat, R-A-S Chonan, C-H-E-O-N-A-N, -N, uh, was torpedoed, most experts believe. It was torpedoed by North Korea, killed 36 people. South Korea, ugh. apparently Im Young-bak, president at the time, 
was willing to send fighter planes up to Pyongyang to get them back for what they've done, and America told him to calm down. A little bit later, North Korea bombed the island of Yongpyong. I uh, killed maybe one or two people. It's not a highly inhabited area. Uh, they, the bombing of Yongpyong, all these have Wikipedia pages, right? So it's not it's widely known. The bombing of Yongpyong Island, again, 2010. South Korea didn't retaliate. No, they announced it ahead of time. They said, we're going to blow that up. Okay. So they did. But there's no retaliation. Because how do you retaliate in terms of military? So there have been a couple of times that there was very close to war. 1994, Bill Clinton was very serious about going to war with North Korea. 2017, whether uh, Donald Trump was serious about it or not, but it was pretty close. People I knew uh, were a little bit scared about it. The point here being is that North Korea does belligerent actions and doesn't receive any sort of comeback. There are reasons for that. Some people want to push back. Other people don't want to push back. There's no unified opinion. But this was recently. Right? This is in the last six months, I believe. Uh, Lana. Right. Um, there is no general Korean opinion, just as I'm sure you would know in the United States, if I were to ask a group of 20 year olds and then a group of 50 year olds, there might be a difference. And if I were to ask rural and urban people and if I were to ask boys and girl, uh, men and women. So it's really hard. It really depends who you ask in terms of this. Conservative sides would say we've, we should do something. It's, you know, it's uh, inflicting. It's our dignity. It's our reputation. So it's not sort of always, I don't believe, it's not always a hunger for war, but it's like, why don't we do something? This is our nation, this is our land. The other side will say, well, no, that we're actually the same nation, we're actually the same land, so we've got to kind of forgive. Like if your brother or your sister or your uncle does something stupid, you've still got to kind of forgive them depends what it is stupid that they do, but there's that family relationship kicks in. So it depends who you ask. When, yeah, there's no answer to that. It really does depend who you ask. And I don't mean that as a cop out. All right. So my suggestion would be go and ask people. Go and ask, go and ask some Koreans. What did you think about the, the bombing of the Kaesong liaison business? And then, you know, find out that way. Ask your K-pop teacher. <laughs> this would be interesting, you know. I don't mean that disrespectfully, by the way, actually. That's not meant to be disrespectful. I teach K-pop and Hallyu. I, I just mean to ask Korean people. National Security Act. Be careful. Yeah. Uh, May 6th, 2021. This runs contrary to the previous slide, so I just told you to be careful, right? Uh, May 6, 2021, this week, the big story, a North Korean defector sending balloons to North Korea with like American dollars and say, come and get freedom. This place is much better, right? So defectors, activists try to send balloons and USBs into North Korea to try to make the people aware of the outside world, right? So this is more like information warfare give the people information, send in USBs with the New York Times and the Guardian and CNN and, and websites and let people see once, like open their eyes. That's what these activists believe. The activists have been doing this, they've just been raided. So again, this causes a big schism in society. Some people agree with this. We can't send information. Does this infringe on South Korean people's freedom of speech? Or should we respect North Korea's sovereignty? It's a very difficult conversation. <clears throat> then 
you have the idea, what should President Biden do vis-a-vis -vis North Korea? Everybody's waiting. President Moon is going to Washington soon to meet him. I believe it seems President Biden is waiting to speak to President Moon to find out what his approach should be. Um, President Trump did something that nobody had done before. He went and met Chairman Kim Jong-un a couple of times. Unprecedented. Unprecedented. It's very interesting that if President Moon does it and President Trump does it, there's different reactions, right? But what should President Biden do? Here is the question. President Biden was part of the Obama administration. President Obama's policy was strategic patience, which basically meant we're not going to do anything. We're just going to... I don't mean that, again, disrespectfully, but strategic patience is kind of, well, we're just going to wait patiently. And during those eight years, North Korea developed its nuclear capabilities and now it has ballistic missiles and it can hit parts of the American mainland and things like this. So you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. I don't have an answer to this, by the way. I, I would hate to have to decide these things. North Korea essentially wants, what does North Korea want? To be left alone? No, it wants more than that. It wants more than to be left alone. Alexandra. I will come to that, but most countries around the world already recognize North Korea. The United Kingdom has an ambassador and an embassy, and we recognize the DPRK as a state, just like America. So in terms of recognition, most states around the world do. America is the exception, right? It's always. <laughs> no disrespect. Monterey. Um, didn't you kind of mention a few class periods ago that they view themselves as owning the entire peninsula? So could that possibly be part of it? It is, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. It's a little bit more specific. It is related to the peninsula, and it is related to what's happening. Lana? This is a quiz, isn't it? <laughs> yes, please. I'm a weird, really bad guess, but isn't like a majority of North Korea like, like owned by the United States? Like, isn't that like what they want? Like, isn't that like what they want? Like, There is a lot of that. So there is a lot of symbolism towards its own people to secure legitimacy for the Kim ruling class. So yeah, a lot of what they do is to secure legitimacy for the Chairman Kim's family. Yeah, there is a lot of that. What North Korea want is... I'm worried now because people picked up their pen. It would appear that what North Korea would want is this. American troops to be off the Korean Peninsula. Oh. oh. Wait. <laughs> How many American troops currently stationed in the Korean Peninsula? 28,500. If war breaks out between North Korea and South Korea, technically, according to, I forget the acronym, like OPCON control, OPCON, operations control, OPCON control, America is in charge. In times of peace, South Korea is in charge. In terms of war, America is in charge. So there's like two four-star generals. My military information is not great. I believe there's two four-star generals, a South Korean and an American. During times of peace, South Korea. During times of war, the American general takes precedent. North Korea wants 28,500 American forces to go. That's their position. You get these people out, and then we'll think about our nukes. But while you're here, we need nukes. So if we didn't have like two American troops there, but rather like South Korea itself just militarized, but like with, I guess, US training or whatever, 
would they still have a problem with that? Or, or is it just like the fact that there is a U.S. presence? Mm. Yep. There's U.S. presence on the peninsula. There are bases all around. There used to be a base in Yongsan next to Itaewon, and I used to go on there to play football. Soccer. I used to go on there to play football <laughs> at the weekend. <laughs> My apologies. Um, I used to go on there to play football on the weekends, and we had to sign in. But I would go there some Sunday mornings, and I would be brushing off my hangover, still drunk probably half the time. And it felt honestly like I was in American suburbia, in the middle of Seoul. I would sit down, and it would be like white picket fence houses in the middle of Seoul. And never forget, this guy comes out, and he goes, Hey, Bob, what are you doing? I'm just walking my dog. This is how they were talking to each other, like that, in the middle of Seoul. And if you go to the subway, if you go to the Starbucks, they use American dollars. It's like a country inside a country. It's fantastic. It's weird. And it makes you question where you are. So there are 28,500 American troops here. North Korea does not want them here. Go back to that time of sort of the West coming in, colonization, Commodore Perry, uh, opium wars, right? That's how North Korea is viewing this, age of imperialism. Read work by Eric Hobsbawm if you're that way inclined. The South Korean view, some South Koreans love the American soldiers. Some South Koreans don't like them, you know? then what do you do? Surely South Korea has the right to choose whether it has soldiers here or not. President Moon, I guess, could give an order to say, Get out. nobody's done it yet. No South Korean president has done it yet. What is the likelihood that if the US troops left, North Korea would simply invade South Korea and be like, okay, now that they're gone, um, it's my turn. Like how, like what's the, do you think, because I feel like if you, I, I don't like the United States that much. I kind of think we kind of suck, and I really don't like. We're everywhere, and it's kind of it's kind of crappy. But who like, do you like? Nobody. No. Uh, okay. Okay. That, just joking. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, if the U.S. troops left, North Korea could literally just be like. I mean, like South Korea still has their military, but North Korea. Like, it's my understanding that the South Korean military is highly trained, excellent technology, physically bigger, stronger. Do they have as much desire and do they have as much sort of passion for the country? Because, you know, North Korea, they do 10 years national service. It's, it's, their, it's their god inside them. South Korea do two years, right? But my understanding that South Korean forces could defend this place. They have the training, the technology, the capability because they've been funded and helped by the United States for 70 years, okay? Um, the last time United, and we'll come to this in the Korean War, the last time the United States forces left in 1949, six months later, North Korea invaded. So if we look at history, history will tell us, well, America nukes countries. So Asian countries are scared. History would also tell us that last time American forces left, North Korea invaded. Would they invade? I'm not sure. If they did, I don't think they would win. But I wouldn't like to be here if or when they do. So what President Biden should do, uh, people are waiting to see. Um, this is an Australian gentleman called Alex Sigley. This is his study card at Kim Il-sung Dehakyo, Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang. Um, he studied there, Munhak Dehak, so Graduate School of Literature, right? 2019, 2020, so fairly recently. This is his North Korean visa. Eventually, uh, I've met Alex a couple of times, he's a nice guy, he's just like one of us, right? Um, eventually, he went missing for about six weeks, got back safely to Australia, and hasn't said anything about what happened. He's writing a book. I guess that's, he's going to put it all in the book. These are some of his tweets from his time there. So this is North Korea, as seen by Alex Sigley, who was uploading Twitter every day. So while he was there doing uh, studying in Pyongyang, 
he, I remember he uploaded him watching like Game of Thrones in his dorm room and things like this, right? These are some of his pictures from Pyongyang. As you look at some of these pictures, it's a subway, subway system in North Korea. Um, it's about four or five platforms down. So if you ever go to Noksa Pyong uh, station, um, you have to go down like one escalator and then another escalator and then another. In North Korea, the subway is about four or five escalators down. Why? Yeah, to protect from bombing. So it's all underground, yeah? But this is the North Korean subway in Pyongyang. So it's stadium, Olympic Stadium, it has a capacity of about 150,000 people. Another view. You notice that there are not many cars. You will also notice that there's a lot of greenery. It's greener than Seoul. I would suggest as well, what you might notice, it's cleaner than Seoul. This could look like any South Korean school, except one thing. What? The other yep, these things right here. On every school, in every room, people have to wear them as badges, on their clothes, right? But this, this like look, this atmosphere, if you showed this to a South Korean person, and hid that, they would think nothing of it. They would just go, yeah, that just looks like a boring old school. Maybe a little bit countryside these days, uh, but you know, it just looks like that. There's the water park. So they have water parks, they have theme parks. Um, they have smartphones now, so they have intranet. They don't have internet, but they have intranet now, so most of the Pyongyang elite can use all of these things. Now, most of these images, my South Korean students, if they see them, they go, what? They have no idea. No idea that modern Pyongyang people live like this. In the mind of most young South Koreans, North Korea is a failed state where people can't eat anything. Now, that's true in some parts of the country. Just as in some parts of South Korea, if you go to Gangnam, Chongdamdong, Apgujong, or if you go down to some less affluent areas, the same in the United States, the same in the United Kingdom. But most young South Korean students that I teach, the undergraduates, they don't really understand these views. They're not privy to them. They have never seen them before. Because information is either not desired, it's not interesting to look at North Korea, they want to look at Netflix, they want to look at um, Miley Cyrus, Selena Gomez, and things like that, they do, right? They're not interested in that. It's not interesting to them. The other thing is, a lot of it is banned. If you go to try to access the North Korean newspaper, government warning will come up on your computer. Of course, though, North Korea is like this. Parts of the countryside, the rural areas, are incredibly rural. Um, living at the mercy of nature. So one of the things about modernity is that whether it's hot, whether it's cold, we can generally survive. Yeah, we have air conditioning, we have heating. South Korean weather is really hectic because in the summer it rains like mad and in the winter it snows like mad. It's really interesting that South Korea is on the 38th, if you take the 38th parallel, that's quite low, right? So London is about 52, it's higher, it's colder. Berlin is about 58, colder. South Korea is quite low down, so its, it's summers are very humid, very hot. But because of this north wind that comes through China and Mongolia, its winters are also really cold. So people there are at the mercy of nature. They also use, uh, require animals. And if you consider these pictures to Pyongyang, these are both North Korea. So I asked Don Lorelli, is North Korea a failed state? If you saw these pictures, you might say yes. If you saw these pictures, you might say no. So what explains the differences between these pictures? Because in normal circumstances, we might say capitalism. 
Capitalism is the difference. Capitalism creates inequality. Capitalism creates haves and haves nots. North Korea doesn't have capitalism, but North Korea has haves and have nots. That was a really difficult sentence to say. So what creates these differences? Alexandra? Government interest? Or like, I guess, whatever government officials are looking out for the more rural areas, so it caters towards the people who are in power and what they need. That's correct, and how is it organized? I've already explained this in a previous class. Um, it confuses me when you sit in different seats. Stella. Not during the Korean War. Earlier. Yes. Can you remember what the system is called? Yep, correct. So it's called, the, well done Stella by the way, so just make sure it, it's not about the Korean War loyalty, it's more about Japanese colonialism, that period loyalty. This is called the S-O-N-G-B-U-N, Songbun, Songbun system. Uh, the Songbun system is what determines in North Korea where you live. So, you will notice that there is a core class. These are the elites. Now, what percentage of the population is in each? It's really difficult to say. You can look at some websites and they'll tell you 20%, 30%. I don't know. So I'm just going to give you rough ballpark figures. The core class, these are the people close to power. These are the elites of Pyongyang. These are the Yangdan. These are the aristocracy. They are born into this class. Uh, and this is high allegiance to the Kim family. So the Kim family, Kim Il-sung, starts as a guerrilla fighter in the hills of Manchuria fighting against the Japanese. Right? Japanese are coming. Kim Il-sung is a guerrilla fighter. By that I mean he's hiding in the mountains. He's operating by himself, fighting against Japanese imperialism. Depending on which stories you read, his escapades are either James Bond-like amazing or kind of didn't really do anything. The truth of this is difficult to ascertain. Some romanticize it, it's like some Rambo story, Che Guevara. Others say it's all fabricated. I'm not sure. The people loyal to Kim Il-sung, those guerrilla fighters, and the family since then, because that one family has ruled since 1945, 48, are in the core class. The wavering class are those that exist in the middle. So core class might be about 20%, let's say. 20% of the North Korean population live in Pyongyang, according to their hereditary. So if your great-grandfather was a friend of Kim Il-sung's, you, it doesn't matter about your life. You get to live in Pyongyang. If you mess up, then that's a problem. But it's, it's, it's about birthright here. Right? So it is kind of like the bone rank system. It should also tell you that it's not some kind of everyone's in it together. We are the people, storm the Bastille, la la la. Right? There are classes inside the system. The wavering class probably operates the most, is about, I don't know, 50%. These are the people that maybe their uncle did something bad or someone did something bad, so your family is... It might go up in the future, right? But you get to live sort of outside Pyongyang, maybe in another one of the cities. The hostile class are people who have done something wrong. Maybe their father defected to the south. It's really interesting when you see North Korean defectors. It's a real moral dilemma because they defect to the south, or they defect elsewhere, and the family that they leave behind then generally go from this to this. That's an incredible moral dilemma to, to, to think of. The other thing that I would tell you is that this, uh, a really interesting point, and I've, and I've spoken to people 
Um, let me get this point out, Montreux, before I forget it, and then I will come to you. I've spoken to people about this, and I've never really received great explanations, but social class exists across the DMZ. If you're part of the core class in Pyongyang, when you come to South Korea, you'll be part of the core class here. When I say core class, I mean you'll live nicely. Which is weird, because you would think that if you're in the core class in Pyongyang, that means you're closer to the bad guys. So when you come here, you should go down. And if you're in the hostile class, that means you should be treated. It doesn't work like that. So Taeyong Ho, Taeyong Ho, he's the highest ranking defector to date. T-H-A-E-Y-O-N-G-H-O, Taeyong Ho. Is the highest ranking defector to date. He was the previous deputy ambassador to the United Kingdom. That's a really luxurious position for a North Korean. Imagine as a North Korean you get to live in London with your family. That's pretty cool. He defected to South Korea. He is now the head politician in Gangnam. Gangnam is the richest area of South Korea. Taeyong Ho, the North Korean former ambassador, is now the head of Gangnam. He was voted democratically here, voted for a North Korean. That's kind of strange. Political class exists across the border, but this hereditary thing is what runs North Korea. Monterey. I was wondering, is it common for people to like change what class they're in then? Since you said like if someone in your family defects you, you like report them to the Hopper class. Are there other ways to really change your class or is that like unusual? Marriage. Marriage would be one way. Generally, people marry according to the same class. I know we have sort of Disney and Cinderella stories and things like this, but in most countries, people sort of seem to marry in relatively similar classes. Um, marriage is one way. It, it, obviously, it's easier to go down than up, it seems to be. But sometimes, I would also add that people will be sent from the core class down to the hostile class for two, three years, and then come back. So they'll send the, the elite people away to the countryside for a few years to get them re-education training. So this was what Mao Zedong did with Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping would become the leader of China, but he was sent away by Mao to the countryside for re-education. So they try to not let these people get too used to the luxury. They always fear you could be sent away. So marriage would be one way. Sometimes the changes would be temporary. Um, Defections would always mean going down. I don't know, does that answer your question a bit? Yeah. Okay, it, it, it's really difficult, so I'm not in, hugely informative on, on the North Korean internal workings. That's hard, right? Audrey. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was just wanting to add, this is more, this is not as much of like a, like a poetry or social as it's more like implied. This is more like a caste system, like it's just like defined your level. It, it depends. I mean, if you want to look at it as a proletariat, I mean, if you want to take this view, absolutely. And I tried to make that clear at the start. And these people, uh, imagine that you ask them, do you like your life? And they said, yep. You want to change? You want to live somewhere else? Do you want to vote? You can vote for Kim Jong-un or President Moon Jae-in. And they said, Kim Jong-un. I mean, th that's their choice. That's their freedom. People might say that's brainwashing, that's lack of information, but it's really difficult because they might enjoy their role in life. They might live there, and, well, they do live there, but they will, they will be part of that land, families, generations, yeah? So you could see it as everybody working together to create a cohesive whole. It's hard to imagine that all North Koreans um, exist on a similar social level, they clearly don't. However, this might be the one advantage that they have. Most North Koreans probably believe the same story. Do most Americans these days believe the same story about history, about the current state of the... No, there's a, an, it's an ideational division. Right? I'm not saying anything about the division itself, but there's a division in the country over the correct understanding of history, of politics, of contemporary life. 
similar in South Korea, similar in the United Kingdom. North Korea probably doesn't have that. They're probably most of them all tuned in to a similar story. This is not to say that they are brainwashed or that they are robots. No, they're people with dreams and lives and fears and allergies and fetishes and all of these kind of things, right? But probably there is a stronger story that unites them. Yeah? So it could be like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, Stella, was your hand up? No. Yeah, so compare, like, if you compare the three classes and like where everybody is, do you think that they're more, um, I, everybody is like um, loyal to the, well, not everybody, because people are trying to leave, obviously, but like those who are, some, most everybody is loyal to the country, but is it more so in like the hostel class? Because you said that they go from the core class to the hostel class to like have like re-education. Is that like you go there and you see what you, you're missing if you continue to do poorly? Or is it like you see how strong-willed, like, or not strong-willed, how like loyal everybody in the hostile class is to the country? Is it just like time out or like what is it? it, it a lot of it is kind of like time out, right? It's putting people in time out. So we, there will often be stories about officials of North Korea killed this official by dogs or they strapped him to a missile you know you'll get these ludicrous reports that come out in the press and they do and then two years later the official returns the official had been sent to the countryside for re-education or retraining or they were getting too big and it's a way of creating you know that sort of uh fear and negative reinforcement i will punish you right so it's a way of keeping the elites in line you might also say that the core class they have a better understanding, they have fancy tastes, they want foreign things, they have a certain, and they'll live, I mean, this essentially is Disneyland, right? It's not Disneyland, but that if you're an elite in Pyongyang, you might say, well, as long as you keep this style of life for us, right, they'll be happy with it. But they might know the real truth more than perhaps the people in the countryside that don't have the access to information, that don't pick up, that don't have DVD players, that don't have USB sticks with dramas and movies and songs and, and things like that on. So the people in the countryside might be the more devout believers of it. And, and you could take Marxist views on that uh, things, you know, religion being the opiate of the masses and such forth. You could also look at what we did with the Schiller dynasty with people reverting to religion during times of hardship and crisis with Pure Land Buddhism. Um, but then we're also generalizing 25 million people, so it's hard to get a good angle on it. One of the ways that I understand this is um, in kind of a feudal way. So imagine if you, like in, in terms of physical proximity, if you have a castle, and then inside the castle walls where the king lives, the, the people close, right? And that's not a bad life because you have protection and there are soldiers and, you know, there will be, uh, what will there be? There will be things like butchers and bakers and all of these things to supply the needs of the castle. And then outside the castle, there will be sort of establishments and a little bit more rural, but they will be close to the castle and trade. And then the further you get out into the wilderness, the more dangerous it is. There be dragons and such forth, yeah? And so I kind of understand it in a proximity way. The closer you are to power, the safer you are, but then also the more dangerous it is because you could get. Hmm? So I understand it in that kind of feudal essence. Um, somebody asked about recognition. So most states around the world recognize the DPRK as a, an official nation. To date, the ones that don't are Japan, France, America. That's it. France has worked with North Korea on various things. So France has uh, liaison offices up there and France actually works quite closely with the DPRK on various things, but it doesn't have an official embassy there because when all the European countries decided to do it in 2000, they didn't tell President Jacques Chirac first, so he got angry and he said, no. Right? That's apparently the story. So it's not that France has a special thing. It's like France is quite close to the DPRK, but not official relations. 
Japan doesn't have official relations with the DPRK yet because North Korea would abduct, would kidnap Japanese people. And Japan from the sea, they would just steal Japanese people, steal South Korean people as well, take them up, teach us Japanese, teach us these things, right? So abductees, the abductee issue between Japan and North Korea is Japan is saying, we're not going to recognize you yet because you haven't solved this issue of stealing our people. North Korea has slowly over the last 10 years or so admitted it, which is a big thing. So for the longest time they said, we don't know what you're talking about. Now slowly they're like, yeah, all right. Um, so that's something. South Korea doesn't recognize uh, North Korea because how can it? If you recognize it, then the country is divided. So instead of recognizing that the country is divided, you live the lie instead. Right? And America doesn't recognize it because... America. Because America. <laughs> because freedom. Apparently, they were very close to recognizing them in the late 1990s. America had chosen the embassy. They had chosen the ambassador. And there was some incident with a cigar and a dress. And Bill Clinton got impeached. And so it fell through. That's the story that I've been told by ambassadors and diplomats. Um, in the 1960s, these countries begin to recognize um, the North Korean state, a lot of it around Northern and Western Africa, Southeast Asia as well. In the 1970s, Scandinavian countries recognized North Korea as an official state. Australia as well, although this had some incidents um, and they cancelled their dip diplomacy. Scandinavian countries, they handle the DMZ, right? So there are some Swedish people right now that can have breakfast in Seoul and lunch in Pyongyang if they want. They can travel between because they manage, they're the neutral nations, the neutral nations that man You can't have Americans managing the DMZ. Right? So they have neutral nations managing the DMZ. Uh, Sweden and Scandinavian countries, they, sort of, they had a sort of socialist attitude towards North Korea. They're like, well, let's try to help them out. Right? Um, 1980s, not much happened. This was when North Korea, I explained uh, the bombing of the Korean Airlines flight in 1987. In 1980, they also tried to assassinate the South Korean president, Chan do Wan, in Burma. Um, do I say Burma or Myanmar? Myanmar. Myanmar. Myanmar, okay, thank you. Um, they tried to assassinate the South Korean president on a foreign trip in 1980. Failed, but it killed people. They put a bomb there. So in the 1980s, they sort of closed their doors and didn't do much. Um, in the 2000s, all of these countries, all of Europe, Britain did it first, December 12, 2000. United Kingdom said, all right, we'll have diplomatic relations with you. After that, that started a domino effect, and then most of Europe did it. Canada did it. What you notice here, what you notice here is most of the world recognizes the DPRK as a legitimate state. Maybe not as a, as a nice state, maybe not as a state that they want to send their children to on a summer holiday. Nevertheless, in terms of international law, the majority of the world recognizes the DPRK. What do you think the consequences of this recognition are? I've kind of already touched on it. It cements the division of Korea. Now there's not one Korea, there's two Koreas. To all of these countries around the world, all of these countries will have a South Korean ambassador and a North Korean ambassador. So when they're trying to work out their diplomacy and their foreign policy and, and things like that, well, we need to have the, the person in Seoul and the person in Pyongyang. To all of these countries, there are two Koreas. To many Koreans, th there's just one Korea. So this is a problem. Uh, Alexandra. Yeah, so, oh, I'm sorry, I'm pretty ill-informed. Mm. Does, does, North Korea doesn't trade with other 
Yeah. Oh, they do? Oh, okay, okay. Because I was going to say, like, the, the real benefit to recognizing the UCLA. Um, obviously, uh, trade, for example, with the United Kingdom, I know, is minimal. It's minimal. Like £1,000 a year or something like this. Um, the United... Uh, Britain has sent... Um, it's tried to open up schools and things like that there. Also does a lot of work with the Red Cross for tuberculosis and... Uh, and vaccines and things like that. Um, believe Britain also sent some COVID vaccines to North Korea because they're a state and we recognize them. They're, you know, it, it's not like you're an enemy. It, we have problems, right? Um, but we recognize them. Countries trade with them. United Nations sanctions make that trade illegal sometimes. So if the United Nations Security Council passes a bill that says North Korea has been uh, forging money or stealing stuff then, or, or um, trafficking arms and drugs, which it does to raise currency, uh, then United Nations will make trade illegal. And they make trade illegal to hurt North Korea because then North Korea can't trade, can't generate the economy, and then the elites in Pyongyang get upset. And if the elites in Pyongyang get upset, then they might overthrow and kind of like, rah, but they don't and they haven't it seems to be harming the people in the countryside more. So countries do trade when it's legally allowed to do. Right, okay. okay. Most trade will not be shouted about. Like if you do a little bit of trade with North Korea, you're not gonna go, we traded with North Korea, because then you, that doesn't look good. It's minimal, it's minimal, but it does happen. North Korea has become part of the Hallyu thing, right? So this is really interesting that they can make North Korea sexy, attractive. <laughs> this is a heartthrob. Like in South Korea, in the Korea, there's, there's this idea of nam nam buk nyo, right? Does anybody know what nam nam buk nyo means? Nam is south. Oh, yeah. um, Elise. Yeah, that's it. That's the, that's the expression. Nam nam, like south, namja. Buk, north, nyo, women. So south, men from the south and women from the north is meant to be the best combination. That's the most attractive thing, right? That's, that's just like an expression that Koreans will know. It's not saying it's, it's good or bad, but nam nam buk nyo is just something that people know. This was kind of a reversal of that, right? This was a reversal of that had the attractive man from the north and the beautiful woman from the south. It also had, you know, this was a big controversy in South Korea, this drama. Crash, by the way, this is called Crash Landing on You. It's Harang Bushijak. It's about a South Korean heiress, like to a conglomerate, to a chebol. She crash lands off her parachute into North Korea, literally into his arms. Um, while the guard is watching South Korean dramas on his guard post, right? Um, it was really controversial because some people said, well, this is opening our eyes and it, it's making us change the way we think about North Korea. And other people said, this is romanticizing and glamorizing the North Korean state, you know, making them out to be, have all of these traditional values and things that we can teach. So it was divisive. It was really divisive. And some people thought it was beautiful. Some people thought it was dangerous. For me, it showed me that you can get something like North Korea and you can turn it into a way to make money and capital, right? In, in this economy, it's absolutely possible. Let's, um, can I do this if I'm being recorded? Yeah. <laughs> I taught a group of international students recently a, a course of Hallyu and when they watch this, some of the students loved this. You might not find it as interesting, but North Korean.
So what I find interesting with this is that um, YouTube has recently begun taking down these videos. So North Korea started releasing vlogs from inside Pyongyang. Okay, so they were run by this woman called Una, Park Una, and she would go, in English, right, today we're going to go to the supermarket and today we're going to do this. And it was, it was really interesting. Obviously, it was very curated, right? It was very curated, but it was North Korea making its own content, posting it up on YouTube to try to show the world. YouTube took it down. Now, this is a really, again, an interesting conversation because to some people, whether you like it or not, that's a fabulous source of information. You know, you can study it, you can... For other people, we have to take it down because it generates money and clicks and advertising and revenue. For other people, it's freedom of speech. Really difficult, but these kind of materials, um, the North Korean ones, this is uploaded by somebody else, the North Korean ones being taken down. So North Korea doesn't have sort of an outlet into the world. It's kind of a uh, break time. So after that, are you any closer to understanding what North Korea is? Do you have any questions at the moment before we take a break? Uh, Lana? So that guy that you were talking about, the Australian one that you met before? Alex Sigley. Alex Sigley. So he's currently in Australia, right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. And his book is releasing? He's recently written some, uh, a couple of small pieces, I believe, in The Guardian. Um, a, is he C or K? I've suddenly forgotten how to spell his name because I always see it in Korean. A L E K, I believe. S I G L E Y. You found him? Yeah. So he's kind of stayed quiet. He went, he went dark for six weeks. I believe the Swedish ambassador was use, uh, helpful to get him out. Went back to Australia. He's kind of remained quiet since then. He's written a couple of pieces, but yeah. Um, okay. Let's take 15 minutes and then we'll start again. Thank you very much. Right, let's, um, so we've talked a little bit about North Korea. Um, I've written quite a bit on North Korea in the academic press, I must say. Not like in the public or in the media press, but um, with Routledge, I've written uh, quite a bit of work for, for them on North Korea. I want to have a look now at the... No, 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 oh, we've done this. <laughs> This was a recent article just to draw your attention to from uh, Tammy Kim in The Nation um, looking at the poet Yi Sang. Uh, specifically, it was very recent, it was May 3rd, so a, a week ago, um, but looking at the language of poets during colonial times and what language they use and using English or Japanese or Korean and uh, draws examples um, from the situations in India as well. I thought it was quite a, a, an interesting look. Uh, we don't really have time for it at the moment, I think, but just to draw your attention to that, and it will be on the PPT if you'd like to look through it later. Because I want to get to this just to make sure we cover it. So in terms of Japanese colonization, we, we finished off here with the narrative that when the Japanese uh, rising sun flag, or the flag is lowered, the stars and stripes is raised in the same place. So this is 1945. The country is divided thus, and I explained it was um, colonels, colonels or generals, I get my ranks mixed up, Bone Steel and Rusk, with a copy of National Geographic drawing a line across the country. Because the Russians were coming in. The Russians were coming into this area, and they were about to take the whole peninsula. <clears throat> so when America said, how about we have the bottom half and you have the top half? They didn't think Russia would actually accept it because America didn't have enough forces here at the time. So Russia was about to come in and take the whole peninsula. America suggested, why don't you have the top half, we have the bottom half, and Russia surprisingly accepted. Russia said, well, okay, it's not our land anyway, it's other people's, we're colonizing and doing imperial. So Russia and America agreed to this division. And the division is not a natural division, it's just halfway across the land. Right? So these two superpowers agreed amongst themselves to divide up the land of the Korean people. You'll see here on the right, General Hodge uh, and MacArthur in the middle. 
So the Americans, these were the two Americans in charge of the southern half from 1945 to 1948. Here you can see a very young Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, with a picture of Stalin above him. The pictures that you saw of Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung on the schools, they used to be pictures of Stalin and Lenin. You don't find many pictures like that, but it used to be Stalin and Lenin behind them. When the idea of Juche become more prominent in North Korean politics, we're doing it by ourselves, they remove those pictures and they put um, their leaders in there. But previously, so Kim Il-sung was essentially a Soviet puppet, uh, just as the South might be considered as well. One difference would be, uh, I think this is quite interesting, in 1945, uh, October 14th and 16th, Pyongyang, Kim Il-sung, Samship Samse, 33 years old. 1945, October 16th, 16th, 20th, Seoul Lee Sung-man Baksa, doctor, he had a PhD, 70 years old. So in the South, their first president, Dr. Lee Sung-man, 70 years old. In the North, Kim Il-sung, 33 years old. Lee Sung Man would be gone by 1960. He would be chased out of the country. Protests erupted in Masan and Busan. Lee Sung Man fled to Hawaii. So we, the, nowadays the, there's kind of like a thing. If you go to Hawaii, that means go away. So he, he ran away in exile in 1960. But when the two countries were uh, divided like this, the South had a very old leader and uh, Lee Sung Man had been the whole time in the United States. So I told you that during Japanese colonial time, there was the uh, March 1st, Samuel Undong, March 1st movement, and then the pro provisional government in Shanghai, 1919, in April. During this whole time, Dr. Lee Sung Man was in the United States. So he wasn't here. So this is, increases the idea of him being sort of an outsider. He was head of the provisional government in absentia. Um, Lee Sung Man also had a foreign wife, which was quite unheard of in those days. I believe Lee Sung Man's wife was Austrian. Kim Il Sung was the guerrilla fighter, the young man full of energy and vim. The guerrilla fighter that was here trying to fight off the Japanese. So just looking at that basic information, the romance leads one more towards Kim Il Sung. The idea of anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism leads one more toward Kim Il-sung. Yeah. This is the <clears throat> authentic Korean leader. This is the outsider. This is the handing over in 1948. So you see uh, General Hodge, MacArthur and Lee Sung Man. Uh, so this is 1948 after three years. August 15th, same day, the Americans hand over to Lee Sung Man. They say, now the country is yours, we are leaving. So Lee Sung Man, you can see a very elderly gentleman at the time. Lee Sung Man was a staunch anti-communist, quite an evangelical Christian, and he was very old. So he wasn't very flexible in his thinking, let's say. Uh, these are some of the scenes with the Taegukki, South Korean flag, right, finally being raised. Korea, South Korea finally gets its nation, 1948, August 15th. Now, this was a common message. Bukjin <clears> Tongil, <throat> march north, unify the country because the Korean War started June 25th, 1950, when North Korea invaded its tanks. So they sent the, the tanks over the border in the morning, like 3 a.m., 4 a.m., June 25th, 1950. But that's the official start date of the war. But if you know anything about war and history, wars don't often just start like that. There's lead up to it, right? There's skirmishes, there's battles, there's to and fro and things like this. And so there was a message in the South, uh, and it was a big thing from Lee Sung Man to march north and unify the country. That was his mission. That is what he wanted. It wasn't coexistence. He wanted to march north, 
take Pyongyang by force, unify the Korean people. That's the destiny. That's the mission. There were various battles between, I'm not sure if battle is the correct word, there were various military incidents before the outbreak of war in 1950. Uh, there was some at Gapyang and Kaesong, I believe. Uh, you can find reports of those. 1948 to 1949, we have the Jeju Uprising. Eight of you are going to Jeju this weekend. The Jeju Uprising, Jeju is in South Korea. South Koreans murder about 30,000 other South Koreans on Jeju because they believe they're communist. So there were various massacres of communists. South Korea was very, or Korea, let's say, was a very uh, factionalized state at the time. Not everybody thought the same thing. Some people thought that the country should be one, should be two, should be democratic, should be communist. Right? It was just sort of coming into birth all of a sudden like this after, what, 35 years of oppression, and before that, the Joseon dynasty, sort of, with its aristocracy, now all of a sudden the people were becoming political agents, were having historical subjectivity, were having thoughts and ideas, right? They were having their own uh, ideas about democracy, revolutions, and, and power to the people, as they should. And this leads to the Jeju uprising, Je Jeju massacre, many different words to describe it. Um, and this is before the Korean War. It says here, human slaughterhouse estimated 30,000 people losing their lives, one-tenth of the island's population. A vast majority of them were killed by police soldiers and anti-communist vigilantes holding, hunting for leftist insurgents and their relatives. During the crackdown, many rebels and villagers fled to the hills to hide in the island's caves. If you go to Jeju, you see various caves and, uh, and things like this. They're interesting to walk through. In South Korea's post-war prosperity, however, golf courses and resort hotels were built on Jeju, not memorials and history museums. Even though the history can now be freely discussed, many island residents choose not to. So Jeju was Korea's Hawaii. Koreans couldn't go abroad on holiday until 1990. So all Koreans, when they went on honeymoon, most Koreans, when they went on honeymoon, went to Jeju. Because it felt like going abroad. You had to get on a plane or a boat. It felt like international travel. It wasn't. International travel was banned. So they went to Jeju. And so the government built sort of golf courses and resorts and villas and swimming pools and la-di-da. But this obviously covered up the history of the Jeju massacre. And it's only really recently in the last 10 years that these kind of stories are coming out. And not everybody likes these stories because again, this is South Koreans on South Korea, right? This is not Japan. This is not North Korea. This is not Yankee forces, but this is South Koreans on their own citizens. And Jeju is probably the most famous, though there are other incidents of people being, uh, murdered in great number for communist sympathies. Three uh, leaders, here we see Kim Il-sung and Stalin, 1945. Uh, Kim Il-sung and Chairman Mao, 1975. Kim Il-sung is Kim Jong-un's grandfather. You can see certain photos. Kim Il-sung also with Ho Chi Minh. When you see the, the, the leader of Vietnam, communist Vietnam, when you see photos of Kim Il-sung and Ho Chi Minh, Kim Il-sung looks exactly like Kim Jong-un, the current leader. So Kim Jong-un, the current leader, Chairman Kim, he's modelled himself on his grandfather for legitimacy. So I think that even includes sort of gaining weight and looking big, right? It's part of the image. Kim Il-sung actually had a, I want to call it a tumour, I'm not sure if that's the correct medical term, about the size of a tennis ball on the back of his neck here. And so all the photos of Kim Il-sung are from a certain position so that this is hidden from the propaganda. You see some photos where you can see it. He had a big sort of tennis ball sized tumor on the back of his neck. Now, <clears throat> Kim Il-sung um, asked Stalin if he could invade South Korea. 
So records were released from the Soviet embassy. There's like a 20 year uh, release date and things like this. So as records came out, it was revealed. And this is kind of like the basic historian narrative. You might find ones that contradict it. You might find ones that support it. But I think this is a, a genuinely respectable narrative to give you, which would be that Kim Il-sung asked Stalin if he could invade South Korea around 1949, 1950. He said, I want to invade South Korea. Stalin said, if Chairman Mao agrees, you're good to go. So Kim Il-sung then went to Chairman Mao. He said, Stalin said, it's okay. Chairman Mao gives the thumbs up. So Kim Il-sung invades. So this is not holding their territory, but invading by force, trying to take the whole land. So Kim Il-sung first asks Stalin. Stalin says yes, providing Mao says yes. Mao says yes, so then Kim Il-sung invades South Korea. Now, as I've said, this is not to paint South Korea in an angelic light. Lee Sung-man wanted to do the same. He had messages saying he would do the same. So perhaps in war, it's sensible to strike first. If you're ever in a fight, throw the first punch. It's probably what people teach you. Peace and love, man. This is a GIF or a GIF or a moving image uh, that will keep playing and you'll see the years going. What happened in 1950, and it will keep going, so it will repeat. In 1950, June, um, North Korea come over the border with their tanks and they obliterate the South Korean forces. And after about three or after a week or so, they have Seoul and they keep pushing look, and they get all the way down to this Busan perimeter, right? So North Korea basically take over the whole country in like this blitzkrieg, lightning war. Let's come back there. Um, and it's very nearly successful. The final perimeter down here is Busan. Busan. So when you see Busan Yoheng, train to Busan, the whole country is run by zombies, but Busan is the last place. That speaks to Koreans in this kind of symbolic way, right? It's that train to Busan can be seen in a kind of the zombies are the communists. You can see it in that ideological way if you want. I don't think it's a coincidence and that will resonate with most South Koreans. When they get, um, come on, Gif. When they get down to Busan and there's just this part, so they've basically done it. There is a United Nations Security Council meeting and they said, the United Nations, shall we help? Now, Russia was not there at the meeting. Russia was not there at the Security Council meeting. The China chair was held by Chiang Shai-shek, the Taiwanese, China, not this China. And so the United Nations decided to send in a military force. And this is one of the only times that the United Nations has sent in a military force. So the United Nations force had 16 countries, obviously predominantly America. They send their force in from Japan, round here, and they land in Incheon. So the whole peninsula has been taken by North Korea, just this bit here. So they come in up here behind the North Korean forces and get them. And what happens, this is General MacArthur's famous landing. This is meant to be really difficult. And he's lauded as a hero for successfully landing here while the whole country's. And they chase them back up. And so therefore Seoul becomes South Korean again. Right? So you want to consider this about Seoul. First, it was South Korean. North invades, it's North Korean. Then it goes back to South Korean. And they push everyone back up. Um, they push the army back up and they, when they get here, they say, shall we keep going? So the South keeps going up to the Yellow River, pushes the North Korean forces back and back. And General MacArthur wants to use the nuclear bomb. He's like, we just used the nuclear bomb in Japan. Let's just do it and we'll take this whole country. When they get up, no, they're pushing. Oh, we're, 19, oh, we're 1951, okay. You notice how for so much of the war, nothing happens. It's just two years of killing each other and no land gain. 
all the movement is in the first year, right? All the movement is in the first year, so quick. And then when they push them back up, they nearly get it and that's when the Chinese come. So the Chinese come and push them back down and they take Seoul again. And then they push them back to the original position. So Seoul changes hands multiple times. Hopefully we're gonna get time to read a little bit about this, but imagine you're living in Seoul at that time. First, it's run by the South Koreans and then the communists come in. And the communists are saying, right, if you're on our side, good, if you're not, you're dead. And then the communists go out and the South Koreans come back in, you know. And then the communists come back in and then the South Koreans come back in. And this would have happened to all of these villages all of these towns and cities up and down as the forces change position and eventually the positions just stay where they are very minimal gain in fact there's no major gain for either side three years brutal warfare tearing families apart destroying and the peninsula is divided in a similar position so what you understand is it nearly worked it's very close to succeeding Kim Il-sung's plan and also then North Korea nearly lost completely except China sent in 250,000 forces just running just men no tanks no guns just just running human war human waves right it ends 1953 three years of bit of fighting it ends in 1953 this is a photo of the armistice and they they agree to a draw right the, the war is still technically going on i'm sure you know this bit but the war hasn't finished the war is just like uh, in a moratorium in a pause it didn't end there was no peace treaty there's no settlement it's just an armistice this is the 1953 armistice agreement which says we'll put down our guns but we're not finished yet this is the first time america doesn't win a war i think How very convenient. Yeah. Well, they didn't lose. So my, my statement was, this is the first time America fails to win a war. Yeah, they didn't win this war. They didn't win Vietnam either. All right. So I didn't say they lost the war, but this is the first time America fails to win a war. Vietnam, probably the second. Both times they leave. Well, America didn't leave after this 1953. That's why America is still here. So when I said there's 28,500 troops here, it's because the war is still going technically. The war is still technically going. That's why the troops are here. Maybe prolonging the war enables America to have a base in Northeast Asia and a footprint to be close to China. Perhaps American forces are here as part of a necessity to prevent further intrusion. Monterey? So earlier on you said that um, South Korean people, like generals or whatever, are in charge during peace times mm. and American ones during war time. So how does that work if they're still technically at war? They're in charge now, but it's not hot conflict. So there are many sort of technicalities with war and, and all the generals will tell you about this. But the war hasn't finished. But at the moment, it's a period of armistice rather than conflict. If it turns into conflict again, my understanding, the Americans will be in charge. So the war hasn't finished. That's why all South Korean men have to do two years in the military. Um, I told you that I spend a lot of time in Gangwon-do. Uh, my family is currently above the 38th Peninsula in South Korea, in South Korea, but just above it. So that it goes kind of like that. And up there, you see tanks, you see airplanes, the roads, they have these, um, I should have put a picture on it. When you're driving down the roads, there are these big uh, concrete blocks either side with bombs on. So if North Korea come in, they're gonna explode these to fall into the road and block the road so that the tanks can't drive. When you're in Seoul, it's very easy to forget the fact that the two nations are still technically at war. If you go closer to the border, you will quickly realize that that is the case. 
the sea, the coast is full of barbed wire. Beautiful beaches, barbed wire all the way along it because North Koreans come along in submarines and come on the coast and things. Alexandra first. Uh, my brother-in-law is a general in the Korean army. Oh, okay, okay. So he is given large accommodation, large place, and we like living together with their family and my family and all the kids together. It's great, and I'm very busy. So it's also the air is cleaner, education is cheaper. So uh, one thing that I will tell you is like in the news, there's all these stories of North Korea's getting missiles and things like that. And then I'll occasionally look at my brother-in-law in his pajamas watching the baseball. And I'll be like, there's nothing to worry about yet, right? So it's a good indicator uh, of what's going on in the country. Um, I want to say Jennifer. Paula. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you for helping me. I tried. I tried. Thank you, Paula. I don't know why I said that was close. It wasn't. But anyway. <laughs> thank you. Jennifer, Paula. Yep. I know that there's a few, like I know Taiwan also has mandatory military service, so I was wondering if that's like a, a trend or if it's because of North Korea. Different countries have different versions of the military service. So, for example, when I've taught students from Singapore, they'll tell me their military service is pretty good and at the weekends that they can go home and they can use their mobile phones. For South Korea, until very recently, only changed in about the last year. It was two years out in the mountains with no cell phones at less than minimum wage, mandatory. Like dig a hole and then the next day fill in the hole like that kind of work for two years. They've, every, every male has to do it, it's a, and it's because of the war. Now, my, my son Edward has a British passport and a Korean passport. At the age of 18, he will have to make a choice. If he wants to keep his Korean passport, he will have to do two years military service. If he doesn't want to do the military service, he will have to give up his South Korean passport. You'll keep his British one, but you can't keep your Korean passport if you don't do two years military service. I have permanent residency in South Korea. If I wanted to become a South Korean national, that I know some people that have, um, I would have to do training. So it's required of all men and it's because of the war situation. So I think it's very interesting, Paula, that with regard, let's say, the current um, gender conflicts in the country, I think they're going to be solved if they are to be solved primarily by the military the war situation while the current half of the population has to do this and the others don't it, it creates huge chasms between the people for two years the men are taken out of society for two years Not gender inequality, uh, lack of understanding across the genders, I would suggest. So for two years, you take half of the population and put them in a situation which is incredibly militaristic, which is incredibly masculine, right? Which is incredible because that's the, the way the military is run. And the military does not involve democracy. In the military, there's one. So my brother-in-law has a thing in his, my brother-in-law is a nice guy has a thing in his office, right, with the Korean hanja, and it says there is only one way. So in the military, if the army are coming, you can't sit down and have a conversation about what we should do. You follow orders. So this increases the kind of hierarchical or structured nature of society. And half the population do it mandatory for two years at a very young, impressionable age. And then they feel resentful that they have to do it and the other half don't. So I believe it's just my personal opinion that it, uh, what, it creates different, it creates difficulties. Okay. Was there a question here? Did I miss a hand? No. Okay. Is there, isn't there a possibility that you can do your service a different way? Like rather than going and like digging holes and stuff, like you can do something else instead of that that still counts as your service? Uh, different people, if you go into, some people want to serve in the American side. 
So if you go into the American thing, that's great. And some people will be doing it in the Air Force and some people will be doing it in the Navy. They didn't allow until about the last year religious exemption. exemption. I was going to say exception is exemption. So that's only been a, a recent thing. You have to do it. That, that's the thing. It's very interesting that BTS are being allowed not to do it. Right. So that's a really difficult. Like Temin's gone to the military this week. Like G Dragon and all that. They they all do it. So it, it, it's interesting to create exceptions to a national law, but it's very much part of the culture here. You have to do it. Yes, Lana. I guess the question that I have, I read articles about Christianity being researched about, I guess, like gender politics or such. Were you aware of that? Because I know that there's been some like research on I will do this, I mm. so much more. Absolutely. There's always hierarchy. But it, as long as you've done it, you're all right. So whether you did it with the Katusa, with the American forces, or the normal South Korean forces, that's better than not having done it. And lots of politicians will have their children born in America to have American passports to make them exempt. There was a story two years ago where one of the leading conservative politicians uh, was getting his hair shaved in protest. They always shave their hairs shave their hair here as protest. Um, he was getting his hair shaved in front of the National Assembly and a reporter asked him, ah, oh, this must remind you of when you did military service. And he went, ah, oh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah. So, yeah, he got his, it was realized that he hadn't done his military service. So it's about you do it or you don't. Yeah. Yeah. But he was like, you can, if you, you can get like a law degree and then you can be a lawyer in the military and you'll have to actually like do like the service. You did like, you, so that's a possible thing. Mm. You have to like do the, I meant like, you don't have to like the physical, like the fully physical labor of it. You can do like something else, but still serve it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There are, there are all sorts and all, all the different avenues of serving information and physical and doctors and journalism, okay. all, all, all sorts. Um, something else about the military. This is the Armistice Agreement when it was signed in 1953. Five points for anything, anybody that can tell me why it's interesting. This is the end of the Korean War. It's interesting because, Alexandra? Oh, I was going to say that there are two Americans, but never mind, that's not it. Is it, well, I don't know if Russia is still, but they weren't, they weren't trying to... No, nope, not officially. Yeah, yeah. No. Nope. They were supporting, but not officially. Obnungot. No opsoyo. Nugo opsunika. Yeah, the dude. Yeah, What's yeah. the dude's name? I know. Sung Sung Hui. Yeah, Lee Sung Man. There's no South Korean signatory. South Korea didn't sign the end of the war document. Lee Sung Man, the South Korean president, refused to stop fighting. No, you idiots. We will not stop because the war isn't finished. I will not sign this. I'm going to commit suicide. Yeah, he threatened this. He's like, you're giving in. How can you stop fighting? So Lee Sung Man refused to sign the 1953 Armistice Agreement. He refused. Give me one second, Alexander, and then I'll ask you. Threatened suicide. He then released prisoners of war against America's orders, acted very belligerently, because he didn't believe that the situation should end like that without a resolution, a situation that hasn't been resolved all of these years later. And in some aspects, you might admire his tenacity, his desire to finish the situation. Other things, you might say that he was very stubborn for not doing this. One of the implications of Lee Sung Man, the dude, refusing to sign this is that today, when North Korea, America, 
discuss ending the Korean War. Sometimes happens in the United Nations that the North Korean delegate will stand up and say, we would like to ask the South Korean delegate to please sit down because they didn't sign the treaty and they have no implication. They are not involved in this situation. The nations involved in this situation are the United Nations, led by the United States, China and North Korea. South Korea is not a signatory to this. So this plays up the idea that South Korea is a puppet state. This plays up the idea that South Korea has no role in the negotiations. That's history. I'd like to show you about 10 minutes of a South Korean talking about the Korean War. This is a South Korean perspective. It's not the North Korean perspective. If I could show you the North Korean perspective, I would show you that immediately after this one, okay? So please keep that in your mind. I will tell you North Korea's perspective is this. They won. North Korea won the war in their minds. They won the glorious war for the fatherland. They got rid of the invading American forces. And they secured the security legitimacy of the North Korean people. They do not tell their citizens that they invaded and then nearly got it, but then kind of yeah, lost it all. That's not the North Korean story. The North Korean story is that they won. And you can see that in the museums there. So scholars and researchers have gone there and seen the narrative and the North Korean stories that they won. Let's have a look at a, a South Korean gentleman telling his escapades. We won't watch the whole thing, but I think about 10 minutes would probably uh, be nice.
이미 군으로 그냥 아 그러니까 아무나 못들어서 그냥 저 남쪽으로 남쪽으로 낙동강을 향해서 내려가는 거죠. 그러니까 그냥 갈 수가 없잖아요. 네. 그래서 이제 다시 빠꾸 나타에서 진성으로 다시 들어왔습니다. 그럼 이제 다시 들어오니까 마을이 어떻게 돼 있어요? 마을이 이제 그제서 또 이제 저 젊은이들이 동네 딸기들이 아이 빨간 완장을 타고 이제 활개를 치고 막 그런 거예요. 인민 재판을 한다 해서 이장 이런 사람을 붙들어다가 등원에다가 이렇게 나는 어 인민 반역자다. 우리들을 전부 오라고 그래 그 동네 사람들 다 모여 이렇게 전부 모라고 그래 놓고서 이렇게 해놓고 그 사람들을 끌고 어. 인민 재판을 하겠다. 이놈의 인민의 뜻을 따라놓고 우리를 못 살게 그런 놈입니다. 이놈은 어떻게 해야 돼요? 어, 그래서 이제 그, 그 충동자가 얘기가 또 하면은 이 동네 사람이 이렇게 했는데 그 중간에 빨갱이들이 입짝짝짝 이렇게 앉아가지고 이따가 죽여라! 하면서 죽여야죠! 하면서 죽여야죠! 그럼 우리는 얼굴만 뻔히 쳐다봐. 그지? 어, 죽여야 된다고. 사형을 한다. 그러면 그러고서 이렇게 나가요. 그러고서 나가서 저 땅에 그 대우가가 있는데 대우가에 가져서 장도 없어요. 그냥 뭐 돌을 쳐서 죽이고 그냥 그러니까 사람들 돈을 앞에서 돌로 몰라. 사람이 돈을 보라고 거기서 그냥 돌을 쳐서 죽이는 거예요. 그러니까 죄 없는 사람들이 많이 죽은 거예요. 그렇지. 그러니까 그렇게 내가 두 사람을 봤어요. 그러니까 그게 동네마다 그렇게 이루어졌으니까 그 숫자가 얼마예요? 많은 많은 사람이 죽는 거죠. 이제 인민군 사이에 이제 어떻게 보면 이렇게 잡혀 있는 상황이잖아요. 어. 거기 도망가지도 못하고 네. 거기서 계속 계셨어요. 그러니까 집에 가다 이렇게 쪽지에다가 그 신육절기 음하는 걸 해서 갖다가 두어서 오고 가는 사람을 여기다가 잡아서 이걸 내라고 그런 거예요. 감시를. 어, 그러니까 이웃집에도 이게 통하질 않아. 그러니까 누가 와서 이 집에 와서 자고 갔는지, 누가 이 동네 낯선 사람이 왔다 안 되면 여기다 잡지 않으면 우리가 큰일 나는 거야. 그리고 또한 가지 뭐냐면 저녁에, 저녁에 사람을 불러 와서 11시, 12시까지 잠을 안 자봐요. 그건 뭐 노래도 가르치고, 공산주의 우월성이라고 장례들 참전을 갔다 하면서 11시 넘어야 아주 고단해서 쓰러지는데 돌면서도 뭐 세뇌를 시키는 거예요. 어, 아주 그냥 그 인간을 애도 시키려고 애도 쓰는 것이 인민군의 방식이죠. 그때 나이가 좀 어리시고 그래도 건강하시니까 자기네 그 쪽, 이렇게 그 편으로 끌어들이려고 뭐. 네, 맞습니다. 이제 전쟁이 저 남쪽으로 더 내려가서 저 부산까지 점령하려고 애를 쓰는데 점령이 모자라니까 인민군을 뽑는 겁니다. 근데 이 나는 키가 작으니까 이 사람들이 좀 연애를 시키더라고. 같은 동창생들 뭐좀다 끌려가는 거예요. 조금 더 있으니까 아 우리 쪽에 전부 나가라는 거예요. 밤에 팔구번에 집을 빠져서 한 20리 가깝게 큰 꼴로 도망을 친 겁니다. 그럼, 그럼 얼마나 도망치신 거예요? 한, 네, 뭐, 좀, 그, 지낸 것이 한 40년 정도 됐는데, 저, 8월달에 갔다 9월달에 갔다. 그 다음에 어떻게 됐어요? 어, 9.18이라고, 이제, 지금 갔다 하면, 인천사진이 작전을 갔다 대기를 했다 하잖아요. 남한군이 계속 이렇게. 어, 그렇지. 그러니까 그냥, 아군이 이제 이렇게 육사단이 이렇게, 그, 순천으로 들어오더라고. 어. 들어오는데, 목이 매일 정도는 반대를 부르고 온다. 난자, 난자, 그냥 얘는 군인만 그냥 눈에 띄었다면 반대를 부르니까 군인만 손을 흔들어주고 내서 그냥 이렇게. 그래서 우리 그 군대 좀 받아주라고. 군인이 옷 모자르니까, 야, 너몇 명이야? 그래, 우리 일곱 명입니다. 하니까, 어, 일곱 명 와. 그래서 들어간 것이 육사단. 학조병으로 입대를 하게끔 되는 겁니다. 그 학조병이라는 그 개념이 뭔가요? 학생들이 군대에 지원해서 싸우는 것이 학조병이죠. 그냥 
학교 복장으로 이렇게. 그렇지, 학생복. 그 학생 모자에다가 그 교복에다가 박지를 달고 어 그것이 학생 보관이에요. 근데 너무 어리지 않다. 그러니까, 그러니까 학생들 지금 지금 학생들은 아주 크죠. 그런데 그때 당시는 그 유교 때는 나도 1m 55, 저 55cm 고그 정도밖에 안 됐었으니까 뭐 학생들도 다다 같은 때라고요. 그런데 그렇게 최고가 작은데 총이 되게 그러니까 애호왕 도청이 내 총이래요. 애호왕 도청이 그러니까 얼마나 무거워요. 그런데 그거를 들고 하루도 가르쳐 주는 사람이 없어요. 내가 혼자서 가르 해오는 겁니다. 훈련을 안 받아요? 훈련을 시킬 사람도 없고 훈련을 받을 사람도 우리는 그냥 뭐 받을 여유, 여유가 없잖아요. 그냥 총만 쥐어주고 가라. 그렇죠. 그런데 죽는 걸 몰랐어요. 죽는 게 두렵거나 뭐 무섭잖아요. 이런 생각 개념이 없어요. 없이 그냥 나가고 이제 38전 도파 명령이 되겠죠. 10월 3일인가 되는 걸로 알고 있는데 오음이라고 하는 다리가 있는데 다리를 그냥 풍대판 보니까 있는 분이 손을 들어요. 가서 보니까 애중이야. 우리보다 또더 어려. 인민군, 인민군인데. 어, 인민군이. 손을 들고서 나왔는데, 야, 너몇 살이야? 1 4 살입니다. 너몇 살이야? 1 5 살입니다. 그러면 자, 손다 내놔. 해놓고서, 야, 너 집으로 가. 손을 잡아도 풍선이라든지 뭐 이런 개념이 없이 그냥 붙이는 하모니야. 이제 원래 그렇게 사람을 죽여본 적이 한 번도 없죠. 없죠. 어, 근데 만약에 진짜 누구를 죽인다는 거에 대해서 어떻게 생각하겠어요? 아, 그 죽인다 하는 생각은 그때 당시에 그 죄책감이라든지 뭐 근데 저걸 죽여야 내가 사는 건데 죽지 않으려고. 그때는 진짜 아무 생각도 안 나고. 어, 그, 그, 아무 생각도 안 나고. 이제 그렇게 해서 토론을 거쳐서 이제 원산으로 가는데 그냥 뭐 인민군들이 얼마나 많이 있는지 빤트를 찢어가지고서 하얀 빤트 해가지고서 그 나뭇가지에다 걸어가지고서 백지를 가지고서 그냥 그러기서 우리가 차를 타고서 북진을 왔다. 근데 거기, 여기서 어디까지 가신 건가? 여기에서 이제 원산을 신고산 타령 뭐 해서 영덕이라고 있어요. 여기에서 순천이라고 있어요. 해천 또 여기 토산입니다. 그 토산에 도착하셨을 때 거기에서 이제 어떻게 되신 거예요? 그래서 이제 맨 모래는 안옥강까지 다 점령하잖아요. 그럼 남북 통일이 되는 거 아니야? 거의 다 점령을 했는데 왜 이게 통일이? 어 근데 저녁에 이렇게 보니까 아니 사람들이 뭐 공중에 뜨더라고요. 또 이상하다 하는데 그냥 그냥 참 엉선 그냥. 저기 뭐야 통 그냥 뭐 그렇다는 소리는 소리가 그냥 중공군이 그냥 이렇게 해서 우리 초보자를 그냥 아주 그냥 중공군이 이제 대입이 되는 거죠? 그렇지 중공군이 그때 당시 중공군이 처음으로 나온 거예요. 그러니까 중공군이 나온다는 건 생각도 못했고 이제 내림은 잘했다. 어, 다 끝나 전쟁이 끝났다 이렇게 되니까 막 당났는데 그냥 아, 네. 그대로 중공군이 이렇게 해서 거의 99%가 그 그, 현장에서 죽었을 거예요. 우리 그, 스레스인데서 나 하나만 살아 나왔다고 그냥 광 중에 살고. 어, 그러니까 다 북진에서 죽고, 나는 경험을 따라서 남쪽으로 이제 부장 와서 사흘 걸렸대. 그 차를 타면서 그냥 옥수수 밭이 있어요. 근데 그걸 따서 내 아기들 이렇게 해서 뭐, 먹고 가면서 이렇게 옥수수 와서 오니까 아군 나고자 수용소에 검정들이 짓고 있다. 근데 내가 운이 참 좋은 것이 군대에 입대를 하겠느냐 집으로 가겠느냐 아 그렇게 물어 어, 학도병이니까 우리는 큰 돈도 없고 계급도 아무것도 없고 10원짜리 한장뭐 양말 또아리 하나 안 줘요 그래서 뭐라고 하셨어요? 그래서 나 입대하겠다 그러니까 이등병이 되는데 이등병이 됐다 하니까 아이 옷과 신발도 주고 군복도 아. 주고 양말도 주고 그때 집에 가실 수도 있었는데 아니 거기서 집에 오려고 생각을 하다 하니까 가봤자 이 전쟁 동안에 공부가 되겠대 그러니까 
아이 군대 나와서 싸워서 이 물을 치고서 금방 그 불신 통행이 될거 없으더라. 그래서 내 손으로 해놓고 아, 내가 저이 공을 세워 가지고서 주일에도 금요 하나 하는 것이 내 그때 당시에 그 마음 가지고 하는 것이. 이제는 이제 이름이 이렇게 돼서 제대로 훈련을 받으셨어요. 아 훈련은 못 했지. 하여튼 이름을 이제서 하루 보통에서 매번 하는데 그 배의 그 사람이 나를 참잘 보는 거지. Okay, I, d I just like to stop it there. There's there's more on the uh, on the PPT. You can watch it in your own time if you'd like. But the observation that I would like to make about that is that it's very easy to see the the, the Korean War as perhaps uh, part of the Cold War, a global war, a civil war. But it's also a war that goes through villages. It's a war that affects people like that. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a reading uh, from this. I asked them to, do we have enough copies? I suddenly feel like. Um, ah, they're all page one. Take one page and pass it round, yep. Take page, pass it around. Oh, that's... Um, this, this piece of writing that will come round, I'm, I'm sorry I should have done it during break, I thought I'd just be able to go bang, bang, bang. I didn't realise it's been done like that. Um, this piece of writing uh, is from a book called After the Korean War, written by Honik Gwon. Uh, in 2020. It's a very recent book, um, but I think it's probably one of the most interesting uh, on the Korean War because it tells the Korean War from the perspective of the villages. It tells the Korean War from the perspective of memory. It tells the Korean War from the perspective of people rather than internationals. Um, What you'll have coming round is just the first eight pages. It's interesting to see you all working together here on this. Teamwork, Teamwork yes. Taylor, you have all yours? Victoria, you've got all yours? Not yet. Okay. I should go to page eight, one to eight. Yeah, 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 perfect. One to nine, sorry. Four to five, anybody? It looks like we've just about done it. Okay. So I'm not sure how much of this we're going to be able to read today, but I, I think there's some really good stuff in here. Um, if I may, Monterey, will you read the first paragraph for us? We can save my voice a little bit. Uh, yeah, an elderly woman, please. Of denial before the men 
even began questioning her about her son. A middle-aged woman is on a visit to a Buddhist pagoda together with her frail mother, with whom she shares a secret relating to the family's war experience in Seoul. Keeping this experience a secret was necessary for the family's survival during the war. However, now that the war was over, to keep doing so had become a source of mutual estrangement for the two women. The daughter knows that her mother is trying to find some solace in the realm of... Uh, Bodhavista. Bodhavista. Mm. Each time she witnesses this, she wishes that she could console her mother, but it seems, feels as though something is trapped in her throat. And this alien office is blocking the words that she is trying to say. She calls this fierce little lump in she calls this fierce little lump her Korean war memory. Very good. Bodhisattva, yes, yeah, sorry, I, I read it wrong as well. She calls this fierce little lump her Korean war memory. Good. Audrey, please. Very good. Um, what we're getting here is the idea that people's lives, their relationships were changed. And this is the next paragraph we're going to read. But South Korean relationships, their lives are intertwined, they're communal. Right? So it's not about independence, it's not about, um, it's more about interdependence, it's about collectivity. Your relationships with your mothers and the people in the village define who you are. And this war was ripping apart those relationships, placing people in opposition to each other. Um, next to read, um, I know, it's okay. begins with an, I'm very sorry, I've forgotten you. Anita, Anita thank you, Anita. I, I'm old, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, the bottom of page three, Anita. Um, indeed, relations, please. Would you read from there? Thank you. Is Between intersectional political entities and the abstract ideal 
these entities others. The concept points further to the reality of the relations between these qualitatively different forms of relations between a state of human relationship and their immediacy and the imperatives of impersonal social forces on a national and global scale. Thank you, Anita. I'll ask you to stop there, please. Um, Stella, across the page, um, the Korean War, please. Page four in the middle. Thank you, Stella. So the first two ideas, one that it's a civil war, the second that it's part of the Cold War. Do you understand the Korean War as a civil war between two parts of one nation divided over ideology? Or do you understand the Korean War as part of the Cold War, two superpowers fighting a proxy conflict with each other? Different people take different perspectives. I'm inclined to say it's both. If you only look at the Civil War aspect, you miss the Cold War aspect. If you only look at the Cold War, you miss the Civil War aspect. It's also my um, belief that if you only look at the Cold War aspect, that kind of denies agency to the Korean people, uh, of which they had agency. But what Honik Gwon here does is he adds, he adds a third perspective. Um, Elise, will you read the next, please? Thank you. 
Okay, very good, thank you. So the, the third thing that Honic Guan introduces, this is a really messy board, but is the idea of the village war. It's the idea of the village war. It's a war that went into the villages. Now, for example, in the Vietnam War, obviously in Vietnam, they don't call it the Vietnam War. Do you know what they call it in Vietnam? The American War, right? <laughs> right? So it depends what perspective you see it from. But this war went through South Korean villages. It went through the places in which people lived. Right? During this war, you have about two, three million, two to three million civilians dead. Not forces, not armed forces, not soldiers, two to three million civilians dead. So Honit Gwani is saying, yes, it can be seen as a civil war. It can be seen as a part of the global Cold War. But it also needs to be understood on the ground level in people's day-to-day -day experience as a village war, a war that went into the village. And this was exacerbated when you saw that moving image by the war, by the front going up and down across the border so many times. So Seoul changes hands three times. Mentions this word, Gwangye, relations, right? Gwangye is relations, links. So society in South Korea or in Korea Chosun is built on these relations. These relations with other people, these relations with people in your Dongne, your village, your neighborhood. And yet this war tears those relations apart, turns people against each other. It makes uh, your neighbor into your enemy, your enemy into your neighbor. And this causes great, great disruption to the, the psychology of the people. So it's a village war. And it's exacerbated by the particular idiosyncratic nature of Korean relations. Tears people apart from each other. Honik Gwon then goes on to mention a little bit later in the chapter that from a Korean perspective, the Cold War is still going on here. The Cold War finishes with the fall of the Berlin Wall, 1990, and David Hasselhoff sings a song in leather pants. But for South Koreans, the Cold War is still going on. Still not finished. Physically, ideationally as well. Ladies, do you have any questions about the Korean War, North Korea, or the period of the early 1950s? I hope that you have some questions, but you're just not asking them because you want to leave and it's Friday. That's great. But I hope I've left you with questions and ideas that you, you need to explore further. Um, so today, we've looked at North Korea in terms of what North Korea is. I've tried to give you multiple perspectives on it, uh, because there are. And we've looked a little bit at the Korean War. In, we didn't go too much into detail because that can be a little bit boring, but as long as you understand, it went back and forward. And if we understand this back and forward with people like Honik Gwon, that tears away the civilians' lives inside. Um, that's it for us today. Uh, have a nice time if you're going to Jeju. Otherwise, I will see you next Monday. Goodbye.